Hello, everyone. I'm Olympia. Thank you for being here with me in this wonderful place called Lights Out Library. And I have a great story to tell you. For tonight's adventure, we will travel by train deep into the history of America's railroads, especially in the 19th century. From the north to the south, the east to the west, through cities and the countryside, spanning cultures and social classes, and one that is intimately tied to the history, economy, and development of the United States. We will learn about economic booms and busts, huge fortunes made by powerful men, the role railroads played in the Civil War, and how trains transformed the country, influencing the way people lived, moved, and consumed. But before we embark on this trip, allow yourself to get comfortable and to take a deep, relaxing breath, one that when you exhale slowly, it will release the tension in your body, your entire body. If you are so kind, I ask you to subscribe to my channel and click on the like button. This helps me keep the stories from being interrupted by ad breaks. As always, you do not need to watch the video to follow along. If you wish to, you may close your eyes and only focus on the sound of my voice. If you do fall asleep and wish to resume the video later or jump directly to a particular part of the story, timestamps are listed in the first comment under the video. Let's begin our story in 1830 in Baltimore, where the first railroad in the United States was inaugurated the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The United States of 1830 was very different from what it would become as the century progressed. At the time, the country had just 13 million inhabitants, a number that had been growing very quickly since independence. But the country was still largely rural and agrarian. Of the population of 13 million, about 2 million lived in the state of New York, the most populous, followed by Pennsylvania and Virginia. New York City had just reached 200,000 inhabitants, and it was by far the largest city in the country, followed by Baltimore and Philadelphia with around 80,000 residents each. Two million out of 13 million, or about 15% of the population, were enslaved, living mainly, though not exclusively, in the southern states. Geographically, the country actually only occupied a third of its current size, the most eastern third. All the rest was claimed territory, claimed by either the U.S., Mexico, or Great Britain. At the time, there were no large factories, and the economy was still based on agriculture, mainly for local production and cash crops for export especially in the South, which were booming to satisfy European and local demand, cotton, tobacco, dyes. There were no paved roads anywhere in the U.S., and buildings were made primarily 
of brick or wood. People still traveled by foot, by horse, or by horse and carriage. But the Industrial Revolution was speeding up in Great Britain and taking off in Western Europe, and with the constant flow of migrants, both rich and poor, this ensured that labor, know-how, techniques, and capital flowed freely into the U.S. economy. So, with an abundance of raw materials and half a century of independence from England, the United States began an industrial revolution of its own. And this was burgeoning in 1830, driven by local investors and entrepreneurs who had accumulated capital from trade, banking, or plantations. There was already a sense among the elite and also the majority of migrants that this was an extraordinary land of opportunities and indeed it wouldn't disappoint in the following decades, at least for those who manage to seize on or invent their own opportunities. Another dominant theme at the time was the call for the country to build itself up, to organize this gigantic and growing space that was still sparsely populated and that nothing should stand in the way, not the geography that would be transformed with new roads and canals, such as, for example, the National Road, which connected the Potomac and Ohio rivers, and which was in use by 1830. Nature would not stop this expansion, and nor would people. 1830 was the year when Congress passed and President Andrew Jackson signed into law the Indian Removal Act, promoting the wholesale slaughter or expulsion to reservation of all Native American tribes from the east to the west of the Mississippi, so that their lands could instead be occupied by settlers and the law was strongly enforced. This is the setting into which railroads were first introduced and built, and train services were put into place. Investors were willing to develop new businesses, backed by a government that encouraged the development of its national territory without interference from native tribes and trains could be used to transport raw materials, manufactured goods, and passengers, too. The very first train services followed and copied British railroad technology because at the time they were the pioneers of the industry. But manufacturing of local equipment especially locomotives, followed quickly in the 1830s. The first fully American locomotive was produced by the end of 1830 in the state of New York for another new railroad company from South Carolina. And it was called the Best Friend of Charleston, it was used along a six-mile demonstration route on which it impressed people because it could reach a speed of 15 to 25 miles per hour. That is, 25 to 40 kilometers per hour. That was a very high speed in 1830. Only a very experienced horse and rider could go faster than that but not much faster. At the time, 
in all the countries where railroads appeared. They were an attractive but also a frightening novelty. In the UK and France, for example, there were calls to exercise caution, including by some physicians, because the effects of such heretofore high speeds on human bodies were unknown. What if traveling at 20 or 30 miles per hour for several minutes could kill people or make them sick? And what if they fell from the trains? For safety, the first passenger cars in France were locked so that the passengers could not open the doors from the inside, which, in fact, was very dangerous because in case of a fire or an accident, passengers would not be able to evacuate. But there was also curiosity. And in the 1830s, when trains were still very new, it was common for people to try them as an attraction, like an amusement park ride, rather than a means of transport. The first American locomotive, the best friend of Charleston, was also the first in the U.S. to suffer a boiler explosion. It was steam-powered, of course, like all locomotives from the 19th century, meaning its energy came from a boiler, where heat turned water into steam. But the internal pressure had to remain within certain limits, like all boilers, so that it could be controlled. There was a valve for pressure release, and it whistled. This is where the whistle sound we associate with trains, even today, in the age of diesel-fueled engines, comes from. It seems in the case of the first train explosion, the crew member responsible for controlling the release of steam, called the fireman, simply grew tired of hearing the incessant whistling. So to stop the noise, he closed the valve. This was, of course, a very bad idea. The pressure within quickly exceeded its capacity, and the boiler exploded. This accident eroded the public's confidence in train safety. So to help restore it, it was common in those first trains to place a flat car packed with cotton bales between the locomotive and the passenger cars as a buffer in case something happened to the locomotive. During the 1830s and 40s, more lines were built and operated, especially in the Northeast around industrial centers the rail network in the north was designed primarily to bring raw materials like coal and iron to factories, to connect them with ports and also to transport passengers as large populations ensure demand for train travel. Cities were absolutely booming at the time. I mentioned earlier that in 1830, New York City had 200,000 inhabitants, but by 1850, it had tripled to 600,000, and by 1900, there would be more than 3 million. But some cases were even more impressive. For example, Chicago in 1840 was just a big village with 4,000 souls. In just 30 years, by 1870, it became a respectable city of 300,000. And in 1900, it had 1.7 million inhabitants. In 
America's cities in the Northeast had a very impressive growth rate in the 19th century because they received the largest part of European migrants from Germany, Italy, Scandinavia, Ireland, and also formerly enslaved blacks who moved north after the Civil War, where industries were hiring new workers by the millions and needed even more labor. In the southeastern U.S., on the other hand, industrialization was much less systematic, the population was less dense, and the economy remained much more agrarian. The primary export was cash crops, and so railroads were used primarily to transport those crops to the coast or nearest waterways, rather than create a network to connect different local markets to each other. Routes simply connected raw materials to ports, where they could be shipped to factories elsewhere. This became a major problem for southern states during the Civil War. The North had a very developed and integrated railroad network that could be used to transport troops and equipment across its territory. Whereas the South could often not rely on its network of railroads that was less dense and not designed to connect its cities or to connect the South to the North even both before and after the Civil War. It was impossible to send cotton to cotton mills in the North entirely by train, which was instead sent to a port on the Atlantic coast or the Gulf of Mexico, and then shipped by boat to New York, Boston, Philadelphia, or Baltimore to be processed. By the 1850s, there were 9,000 miles or 14,000 kilometers of rails in the U.S. This was more than England or France, but covered a much larger territory. So the network was less dense, and the U.S. government wished to accelerate the development of railroads with technical progress that improved speeds. Railroads were increasingly replacing horses or stagecoaches in the Northeast and also for travel from the East Coast to the Midwest. But beyond the Mississippi Basin, everything remained to be built and the great migration to the West in the years 1830 to 1850 was made essentially with horses and wagons. To stimulate development to the West, the government favored the use of land grants, meaning the government gifted land for its use to encourage migration, settlement, and development. This provided the basis for faster expansion and, to this end, new railroad companies were given millions of acres in the West in the 1850s and 1860s. As a result, the industry picked up speed and in addition to railroad mania, there were a number of transformations in American society that went well beyond the railroads themselves. A number of inland cities turned into sorts of inland ports thanks to their connection by train. People could transit through them on their way further west, 
it now made sense to build factories or warehouses in these inland locations because, thanks to trains, they could receive and send materials, manufactured goods. This is how cities like Chicago experienced tremendous growth over such a short period of time. And railroads could be operated all year round. Unlike river and canal boats that couldn't traverse frozen waterways, they were also more flexible because with the construction of tracks, they could reach almost any destination. So, after putting all the stagecoaches and wagons along the main lines out of business, trains competed with and eventually eliminated steamboats as well in the second half of the 19th century. As railroads continued to expand, a civil war erupted in 1861 and raged on for four years until 1865. Based on population, economies, and industrial capacity, the war was very unbalanced in favor of the North and railroads were one of the reasons. As I said before, the North had at its disposal a dense and better designed network that helped to transport troops and move equipment and supplies around. In contrast, in the South, rail lines connected cotton regions with waterways or the coast which had less military value. Since almost the entire railroad industry was based in the North, the lack of spare parts and the destruction of the war, which was fought primarily in the South, caused the collapse of railways in the South. After the war, when Reconstruction began, the southern network was expanded dramatically, but mainly by northern companies and interests. But even before the Civil War was over, the government of the Union was planning for railroads to be expanded westward so that the Atlantic and Pacific coasts would be finally connected. This was a decades-long dream. There had been a movement of population to the West since the 1830s, but reaching California or Oregon from the eastern United States was very complicated. There were two possible routes, by sea or by land. By sea was ridiculously long, the Panama Canal did not exist, so ships had to travel all the way to the southern tip of South America and across over into the Pacific via Cape Horn, which is one of the most notoriously dangerous and deadly sea routes in the world, and then go north all the way up to North America. It was expensive. It took weeks even on steamboats, and there were multiple stops along the way. It was a highly impractical way to travel west. The alternative was by land, but at that time there were only very basic roads or tracks. Still, this is the way hundreds of thousands of migrants traveled through the Midwest and the Rocky Mountains with wagons, carrying all their possessions and families with them. The appeal of a transcontinental line 
or several, was obvious. But this meant thousands of miles of tracks and a huge financial investment. This was one of the projects that changed the scale of the railroad industry and required the use of large public companies listed on the stock market and funded by stock and bondholders. In the 1860s and 70s, the need for workers to build and operate railroads was considerable. This was a time when tens of thousands of Chinese and Irish workers were hired to work on the tracks, and railroads became the biggest employer in America, second only to agriculture. The first transcontinental railroad was opened in 1869 to great fanfare. The starting point of the new line was in Iowa, and it reached San Francisco, finally connecting the existing eastern network with the Pacific coast. The time to travel from one coast to the other dropped only to six days from six months via wagon, and this was crucial to integrating the American territory into a single economy, a single market, and also to controlling it. Other transcontinental lines followed shortly thereafter, one to the south through Texas and New Mexico, to Southern California, and one to the north, following the border with Canada. Now, the development of railroads had many other consequences than just rail lines. It had consequences that are maybe less visible, but deeper and really interesting to examine. It is hard to overstate how Railroads transformed the United States. They had repercussions on many levels, on American society and in the U.S. and global economies. So let's take a look at all these aspects before we return to the chronology. First and foremost, we must acknowledge the human cost. At least 1,200 workers died in the course of the construction of the Transcontinental Railway. Though this is considered to be a low estimation, at least 90% of the workforce was Chinese workers as white workers did not sign up for this back-breaking labor in sufficient numbers. And these imported laborers faced wage and racial discrimination and were given the most dangerous jobs. Over 1,000 sets of bones were returned to China for burial over the course of the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. U.S. railroads continued to benefit from their labors, as well as from their labors of unpaid, enslaved black men and women, who almost exclusively built the first railways in the Southeast. Furthermore, the multiplication of railroads created and connected a single market, which is important for a modern country's economy. Prior to the development of railroads, the national economy was very fragmented. Of course, there was trade and transportation of goods on trade routes, like waterways and roads, on shorter distances. But this was slow and expensive, so in practice, for most goods, the economy was very local. 
not just in America, of course. This was the case all over the world. But this was even more so the case in the United States due to its size. Before these train lines opened, remote states like California or Texas were barely connected economically to the Northeast. There was a movement of people. The U.S. was a political entity, but there was very little economic activity between states that were far apart. This completely changed when New York City and San Francisco became connected, and a factory in New York or Pennsylvania could now send goods to the other side of the country in less than a week. So this naturally boosted growth for the industries that now could access a much larger market. With this came much larger factories at a scale that had never been seen before, with thousands working to satisfy this much bigger demand. This naturally wasn't without new problems. American capitalism in the 19th century saw spectacular fortunes emerge in various industries based on huge companies that establish monopolies or oligopolies in metallurgy, mining, later in oil, and even in railroads themselves. A few men established huge fortunes in these new industries in a way that is not so dissimilar to the tech titans of the past 30 years. This was a completely new phenomenon back then and because there was a lack of regulation or control over business practices, industries could sometimes employ very brutal methods to monopolize a market. They removed their competition, sometimes even physically blocking their competitors, and antitrust and consumer laws. The regulation of businesses were born from these anti-free market practices. Still, spectacular fortunes were built, which in railroads included names we still recognize today, like Cornelius Vanderbilt, Jay Gold, or the banker J.P. Morgan. Vanderbilt made his wealth initially in shipping, he was born in 1794, so when railroads appeared in America, he was already a mature and experienced businessman. He understood early on that railroads were the future of transportation and would probably replace boats, so he invested heavily in the industry and ended up owning the New York Central Railroad, which was located in the Northeast. It connected New York City and Boston in the East with Chicago and St. Louis in the Midwest. Vanderbilt not only invested, he also created and embraced new forms of organization and management to deal with the increasing complexity of railroad networks and the economy in general. He was also one of the early users of the financial market and public companies to gather capital and to use it to compete. He had a reputation for having brutal business methods like other businessmen who were successful at the time, as well as for being an entrepreneur. By the end of the century, men like him were called robber barons for their exploitative practices. 
controlling natural resources, influencing government through relationships, or even corruption, paying minimal wages and crushing the competition by acquiring or ruining competitors. There is some truth to it. I mean, actually, robber barons did all of this to maximize profit and to grow even more. But they were probably driven more by the thirst for power and prestige, by a competitive drive and the urge to build their companies, than by pure greed. They obviously liked wealth, but these men gave back a substantial part of their fortunes to charities, universities, churches, libraries, and public buildings like museums. There was probably at least a partial calculation with an eye to public perception and relations. But still, the fact that these robber barons worked until their final day seems to prove that they were driven by more than accumulation of wealth. Vanderbilt's fortune of the 1870s, adjusted for inflation, would amount to more than $200 billion today, which is to say something comparable to Amazon founder Jeff Bezos' fortune. One of Vanderbilt's rivals in the railroad industry also based in New York, was J. Gold. Gold started out investing in railroads, buying stocks, and he took huge risks at the beginning, risks that more than paid off. In 1857, he took control of a company, the Rutland and Washington Railroad. During a panic, that allowed him the opportunity to buy shares for 10 cents on the dollar. He continued to invest in the stock market, but he improved his odds by manipulating prices and using insider information. These practices were obviously totally illegal, but at the time they were harder to prove and actually quite common. Gold speculated on the other industries and commodities as well. For example, he was involved in a scheme to corner the gold market, to buy enough to make the price artificially rise and then sell with a profit when the movement took on a life of its own, when others started panic buying. This time, though, it backfired and the price of gold collapsed suddenly in 1869. But Gold and his co-conspirator, another magnate called James Fisk, managed to escape prosecution thanks to their political connections. Once this was made public, Gold became one of the most hated of the robber barons. But these men were also empire builders, and they represent an aspect of the times. There are many more familiar names in the other industries, like Andrew Carnegie and Henry Frick for steel, John Jacob Astor in fur and real estate, William Randolph Hearst in media, John D. Rockefeller with oil, and J.P. Morgan in banking. But let's return to the impact of railroads on the American economy and society. Another consequence of railroads was that they stimulated the emergence of a private financial system. As I said earlier, the need for capital to fund the construction of railroads was bigger than ever seen before. To give you an idea, one mile of track cost the same as a new steamboat. 
so the construction of the first transcontinental line costs the equivalent of 3,000 steamboats. No single investor could pay for that, and banks were not large enough to lend that kind of money. It became necessary to organize a financial market of bonds and stocks for investors large and small, could contribute their own capital. Until the First World War, railroads were the basis of the largest industrial and economic boom in the U.S. history. And this also changed the lives of ordinary American workers and consumers. Workers, because of railroads, revolutionized management. Before the railroads, factories were smaller and managerial techniques simpler, typically requiring only one manager. But when industry started to produce in multiple locations with factories that supplied each other, the need for more organization optimization of resources and efficiency appeared. Engineers became necessary to manage industrial and even service businesses. Railroad companies also grew much more complex. As they grew in size, they became big employer of professional managers who helped organize the ever-growing traffic on their larger and larger networks. One important factor that made organizing train traffic even more complex was that most lines ran in both directions but shared a single track. So when rail lines had dozens of stations and hundreds of freight clients and countless passengers, you can imagine the complex scheduling and organization that this required. Work became much more time-sensitive and probably more stressful than it had to be for all the people involved. It changed the way people worked and the distribution of responsibilities within businesses. Consumers were also very much impacted the variety of goods available increased dramatically. Prices dropped, and the first stages of mass consumption began, albeit very modestly in comparison with what it would become later in the 20th century. Now, when the working class people could occasionally buy manufactured goods, Railroads and department stores developed concurrently. Large stores in cities depended, at least in part, on trains for freight. So trains made it possible to operate such large stores. Even though America was increasingly urbanizing and large cities were booming, the majority of the population still lived in small towns and rural areas. The proximity of a train station connected people who might previously have not traveled to big cities. And most people could now go at least once in their lives. This opened new horizons and helped to accelerate the growth of cities because they were seen as attractive places to live. With department stores, another form of retail appeared, the mail order catalog, and this burgeoning business model also relied heavily on railroads. The most well-known success story in this category was Sears and Roebuck which later opened physical stores, but began as a mail-order retailer. 
They sent big catalogs by mail to consumers in every state, to cities, but also to small town America, which was the market they targeted. After making purchases, clients could pick up their products at the nearest train station. You can readily find images online of the Sears catalog from these years and find a fascinating glimpse into the past because also a study in modern consumer marketing as it's being invented and deployed across a broad range of consumers. The catalog displays not only the description and price of a huge range of goods, but also demonstrates the way Sears sold itself to consumers. In the catalog, they take the time to explain why their prices are supposedly much lower than those of their competitors. They try to create a complicity in the relationship with clients using a mix of rational and emotional language. And they apply this sale model to all sorts of products, from books to musical instruments to clothing to agricultural equipment. Many of their customers were, in fact, farmers. Yet another consequence, and this one was favorable for workers, was the career path offered by railroads. It tended to pay better than other industries and offered benefits, including some of the first pension schemes for blue-collar workers. Railroads hired men around 20 years old, and as long as they stayed with the same employer, they had prospects for advancement. They would start working on the tracks, then become firemen, team supervisors, and some of them could work their way up to become engineers changing their status and standards of living. Mechanics also had a career path. They could begin as shop workers and be trained by the company to become skilled mechanics and later freight and passenger conductors. The railroads were also the number one employer of African Americans after the Civil War presenting a viable and reliable alternative to agricultural or domestic labor. So there were tangible advantages that came with trains, and railroads were widely embraced by Americans. Even without taking a train or waiting for a passenger, people in towns in the 1830s and 1840s could watch the trains arrive. The vision of a massive locomotive traveling hundreds of miles at high speeds, thanks only to engineering and industrial processes, was thrilling at the time. A similar phenomenon appeared later with planes in the early decades of aviation. People went to airports just to watch the planes take off and land because it was downright exhilarating. And train stations were designed to match the majesty of train travel and went well beyond mere functionality. Like in Europe, stations became monuments with impressive architecture and ornamentation, such as Union Station in Washington, D.C., or Grand Central Terminal in New York City, distinguishing them from other buildings of the Industrial Era. For any American cities, 
that were already of significant size by the end of the 19th century, or even for small towns, it became vital to be connected to a train line. Without a train stop, a town could decline or even disappear. Therefore, cities and states also participated in funding or land grants to railroads to ensure that they were not left behind. In the face of this enthusiasm, there were a few opponents, at least initially. Some lobbies, like transporters of waterways, were hostile to railroads for obvious reasons. When railroad construction picked up speed in 1830s and in the 1840s, a few artists and poets lamented the damages they would do to landscapes. But this concern never carried much weight with Americans. The most significant opposition arose from farmers, starting in the 1870s, when railroads had gained considerable power. In some regions, railroads were monopolies and could impose higher prices for transport. Laws were passed to fix maximum prices to prevent abuse, however, even after the first two generations when railroads became a fact of life, their image became more complicated. Besides being life-changing, they also became symbols of monopolies and unhinged capitalism. They had the power of life or death for towns bypassed by the trains, and their owners had built fortunes. There were several scandals related to these owners' activities, such as collusion with politicians or market manipulation. So they became vilified. And here again, the parallels with modern tech are in abundant evidence. Now, the intense development of railroads didn't go without booms and busts. It was never linear. The 1860s were a very favorable decade, despite the Civil War. However, in 1873, there was a financial crash that had severe economic repercussions almost until the end of the century, and a period of slower growth began before it reaccelerated at the turn of the century in the 1880s and 90s. Most main lines had already been built, and investment slowed down. It was now time to reorganize and unify the American network which was operated by dozens of companies. It was necessary to harmonize prices and facilitate long-distance travel. A lot of this restructuring was organized by J.P. Morgan, the banker, whom I mentioned before. But the Gilded Age was coming to an end and the age of automobile was about to begin. The rail network peaked in length of trackage by 1916, with more than 250,000 miles of tracks, which is equivalent to 10 times the circumference of the earth. But in 1916, the railroads were already under attack, and the future would be quite different for them. The magic of the first ticket 
when people would gather to see trains pass by and when there was a sense of progress and the wonderful opportunities associated with railroads had faded. The railroads controlling interests were probably too concentrated and had acquired too much pricing power. By the beginning of the 20th century, some of these monopolies were dissolved and broken into separate companies as part of an antitrust reform movement, especially under President Theodore Roosevelt. In the 1900s, laws were passed to set maximum rates and to review the company's financial records, ensuring that they were not unfairly profitable. Politically and socially, the positive image of railroads had evaporated, even though they were still vital as an industry but there were still more massive changes ahead. During the First World War, which the U.S. entered in 1917, it became apparent that the rail network, with all its private, separate operators, was unable to adequately support the war effort which was essentially about equipping and sending troops to Europe. So in 1917, rail management was nationalized, meaning the U.S. government didn't assume ownership of the companies and their equipment, but just their management. And this lasted until 1920. This temporary nationalization had revealed a weakness in the American railroad system. Private initiative, supported by the state, had been very good at creating a large network, the largest in the world, and lifting the entire economy with it. However, the multiplicity of operators and companies also meant that facilities were duplicated and prices were all over the place. Due to their specificities, it is hard to choose between private and public management of railroads. The private sector had done wonders at creating and developing what was now the biggest American industry. But if left alone, it tended to create regional monopolies that penalized the consumer. Regulation didn't work that well either because when these monopolies were broken, the system tended to become inefficient. The option chosen in 1920s was to let railroads operate as businesses, but with tighter control over their prices and forced consolidation that would create larger regional systems. But before this was implemented, Railroads were already starting to decline anyway, after World War I. The automobile era had truly begun, and the wonders of the day were no longer locomotives, but individual cars and trucks that could compete with trains and that were much more flexible in transporting people or freight from one point to another. And then along came the crash of 1929, followed by the Great Depression in the 1930s. Like all other sectors of economy, railroads nosedived. Many small railroads failed. <laughs> 
and were not rescued by the government. The policy in the first years of the recession was to let businesses die, which was understandable, but which also fed the Depression. The survivors were unable or uninterested in supporting the weaker ones, and the downturn affected the industry as a whole. Financial losses meant that the excess profitability of railroad companies was no longer an urgent problem. The issue instead was now to keep them alive, to avoid further damage to the economy. Even though the Depression was overcome, American railroads never recovered. Their golden age had come to an end, replaced by the automobile, the popularity of which only accelerated after World War II in the 1940s and 1950s. The government and the country were still invested in infrastructure, but railroads had been a priority of the 19th century. Highways and a network of better paved roads were the priority of the 20th century. And additionally, airplane travel joined autos to compete for long distance passenger travel in the 1950s and 60s. Most railroads abandoned passenger train service except in very densely populated areas for short-distance trips, like along the East Coast. For many Americans, the practice of using trains is something that ceased during this period, as opposed to countries like Japan, the UK, Germany, or France, where trains are still a routine part of life for travel both locally and for longer distances. This is due to the fact that distances are generally shorter than in the U.S. and that governments in these countries have taken over and nationalized, if not the entire rail operation, at least the infrastructure of the tracks and stations. So for American railroads, Income sources were shrinking. The need to invest had never disappeared. Tracks had to be maintained and rolling stock. The engines and rail cars had to be modernized. Diesel and electricity replaced steam to power locomotives. Passenger cars had to be replaced too and it appeared in the 1960s that the industry was no longer viable in its current form, so it was nationalized. A company owned by the government, Amtrak, was created for passenger traffic. It still operates long-distance lines, but its market share is now very small compared to that of airlines. And it is uncommon for Americans to use trains for travel. The only region of America where there is heavy railroad traffic is on the East Coast, as many people still use trains to commute daily. Freight commerce was more viable because it remained competitively priced over long distances. Transcontinental lines still work to carry heavy loads from coast to coast and across the Midwest. Freight is operated today by various railroads that were deregulated once again in the 1980s, and there has been a modest revival of freight shipping 
due to rising costs of fuel that made truck transport more expensive, as well as the construction of new terminals near ports where containers can be directly loaded onto trains from ships. Obviously, American railroads are now a shadow of what they once were in terms of their importance in daily life and their influence over and the role in society and economic changes. But trains are not dead, and there are projects being studied or already under construction for high-speed passenger trains to serve regions in the U.S., such as the Bright Line now in operation in Florida and a large project in California to connect Los Angeles to San Francisco in under three hours. But it is not expected to be completed before 2033. We have once again reached the end of our journey. And until we meet again, good night, sleep well.